Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of our regular podcast dedicated to digitalization, sustainability, and procurement in construction. Uh, through this podcast, uh, which is organized by WeThink.eu in cooperation with uh, different researchers across Europe, we aim to facilitate the interaction between the academic sector and all the relevant stakeholders from the construction industry. Uh, for this, we strongly believe that uh, the implementation of uh, new research concepts um, is always challenging in, in the construction. So a close cooperation between researchers and construction practitioners can ensure that the research results would be acceptable and also applicable in the construction organizations. In this regard, for today's episode, I would like to welcome again our moderators, Professor Mario Galic and Hanna Begic from University of Osje, Croatia. And also, I would like to welcome their guest, uh, Mr. Tomislav Martinovic, uh, an enthusiastic student, passionate about architecture and construction engineering, uh, also with a broad international experience who has uh, gladly accepted to share with us his thoughts on, uh, on the latest technological approaches in the construction industry. So without uh, any more further introduction, Mario, um, the floor is all yours. Uh, th thanks. Once again, I would like to welcome you to our podcast, the second one. So uh, in, in comparison to, to the last one, we will have the same topics, I would say. But, but from a bit different perspective, due to our guest today, his perspective. We will talk about uh, BIM mostly, about Construction for All. Uh, how do you feel and how do you see this transition from, from cyber, cyber physical to, to, to construction industry in general? But first of all, I would like to have this introduction a bit personal. I, I, I have this. Uh, privilege to, to do so. Uh, when I came to the university, I, I found myself in, in a bit of a trouble because my previous experience was, was dealing with uh, engineers and practitioners mostly on, on construction sites. And then I came to the university to have these communications with, with student, students that received uh, things, the same things, but in a different manner. And I, I could not find the, the mutual language in the beginning. And then I have to firstly go to, to this self-evaluation and, and analysis if I'm up to, 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 to be a teacher or a professor at the university. And then I came to, to, to some conclusions that, firstly, teaching is much, much harder than I thought and most people think. <laughs> so, uh, and the second one, is that uh, there, is, there is a unique uh, approach for teaching. You have to be yourself and then find a way to, to, to approach each student in a different manner. And then I will have to say that, that every once in a while, there is one student per generation and I have this luck that I had two students such at, this, at, at the same generation. One is Hana and one is Tomislav. Those students stood up. The, the, this problem in the classroom that I was talking about uh, always end up with, with, with the bare minimum of students without any further discussions, questions, uh, motivations. Uh, just, I would like to, the, the perception of, of the higher education for, for most of students are, is uh, just to, to, to take this to minimum pass the exam and move forward. But those two, Hanna and Tomislav, really made me think some, some, some classes. And I'm really privileged to have them both here at our podcast to, the, to discuss some, some things that I would like to discuss with most of our, our colleagues. And for this one, I would like to say hi to Tomislav. Tomislav finished his master thesis here in Osijek at the University of, of Osijek. Uh, he finished uh, his master thesis in civil engineering and now for my great 
uh, surprise, I would say, uh, he is now finishing his studies in architecture in Denmark. So, Tomislav, how's life do, doing you and, and how's everything in Copenhagen? First of all, I want to thank you for the very nice words. Uh, I have to be honest, uh, I, I, I listen to podcasts a lot. Like a majority of my free time is filled up with, with listening to different podcasts. Uh, and being invited to such, it, it was uh, really exciting for me. And second of all, thank you for the nice words. It's really nice to see some familiar faces and some new ones, of course, meeting some new people. Uh, how's love going? Life? Uh, I would say all right. We are just wrapping up our thesis. Two more weeks to go until uh, turn-in. And then we are waiting for the thesis defense date. That should be about two weeks from the turn-in. Should be fine. I'm the, the thesis topic is really, really broad. We, we got a lot of freedom. But with a lot of freedom, you get a lot of responsibilities. So right now, right now, I wouldn't say we are scared, but we are worried that we we want to try to, to, to write and describe everything in detail and as clear as possible because you have a lot of stuff on your hands. And if you don't communicate it in a nice and, and, and digestible way, uh, it, it might not communicate the message that you were intending to do. Yeah. To, to, to transfer. I have two questions already. <laughs> when you <laughs> said, uh, firstly, you you are saying as plural, we have a thesis. Yep. So th this is something new to me because we have this one-on-one uh, -on -one yeah, yeah. student and uh, professor. Are... It's three of us. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, uh, I'm, I'm uh, my name is Tomislav and then two of others, Kin from Hong Kong and Alina from from uh, Czech, born Ukrainian, living in Czech, now living in Denmark. Um, we, we, to be honest, like parts of that topic, could we, we could do it on our own, but the amount of work done by three of us together, I don't think I, I, I myself alone or, or neither one of them could do it probably in a year or so. Oh. And uh, in, in Denmark, um, compared to Croatia. In Croatia, we had this kind of open-ended approach to a due date for a thesis. You're constantly in talks with your supervisor. And when you two decide that it's all right, that you can you can go and defend it, uh, you do so. In Denmark, also we communicate a lot with our supervisors, but we have a set up due date and we have to, we have to respect it. So we even got a small uh, extension, but it's a bit more rigid in terms of uh, due dates. So I would say uh, if I were do if I was doing this alone or or one of them, it would take us a lot more time. It's it's actually pretty common uh, for for students to be in teams for their thesis. As I said, they can do a lot more than than being alone. And then second of all, uh, you're usually working with uh, industry partners. Uh, we, we have a couple of them on our project as well. Uh, we can go a bit further into detail if you want about the actual thesis, but it, it ties up a lot. I got a sneak peek to a previous episode, so it ties up a lot with topics that you discussed and, and, uh, yeah. Um, one thing I want to correct you, um, it, the, the study line I'm on. It's, it's architectural engineering. And I have to be honest, I'm pretty proud of the second part of the study line name uh, because I'm, I'm, I just realized this a few months ago. I'm educating myself in this industry for like 10, 11 years. I had an opportunity in Croatia for, those, for the listeners who might not know. In Croatia, we have an opportunity to go to uh, vocational technical high schools. Uh, I was the, one of the ones that uh, decided to do so. And my, my high school diploma is, is uh, architectural technician. So my, my architectural education was, was highly technical, I would say. And uh, looking at some, I would say, not traditional, but usual workflows of, of, of architects, uh, I, I wouldn't say I, I fall into that uh, part of, of the industry. Uh, we do a lot more analysis, maybe sometimes before it's necessary, but again, with, with construction industry 4.0, BIM, sustainability pressing us from three different directions, 
uh, I think it's 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 becoming more and more necessary. Okay. So uh, thank you for for the introduction and and making the record straight. Uh, <laughs> you actually said something that I, I, I usually think, but not, not brave enough to say it out loud. <laughs> for me, <laughs> the, there is only artists and engineers. As an architect, you are either an artist or you're an engineer. So in that perspective, I, I see architecture and engineering uh, working together. I and know. sometimes not. So, uh, Tomislav, what is the topic? Can you say, if you if you can say? Of course. Uh, by by the time the podcast is out, I think we're going to be turning in. So, the thesis topic is about transformation of the existing buildings. Uh, some research shows that in the UK, eighty percent of the building stock that is going to be used in twenty fifty, uh, it's already here. It's already built up. So even though sometimes the talks about sustainability and, and energy efficiency are mainly about the new construction, the harsh reality is we have a lot of existing building stock that we have to improve, renovate, uh, transform. There's a lot of different terms that are more or less loose, loosely used. And uh, we got a study case. It is... Uh, in, in a part of Copenhagen, uh, a little building, not, not even a little, 3.5 thousand square meters of useful space um, that is initially built in 1934 uh, for the purpose of being a factory. Uh, it got through a lot of iterations. Uh, it even got attacked by uh, Danish resistance in, in the Second World War, uh, fixed, repaired. Uh, got back up running and right now it's serving as an office building and with the new urbanization uh, I would say trends of, of people moving to, to cities uh, Copenhagen and majority of the other European cities I would say are struggling with residential demands so our study case is, is, is uh, exploring the options of transforming uh, the building that is right now being used as an office to a residential use along with some other commercial spaces on the ground floor and yeah we try to go a bit differently about the topic so rather than just saying okay this is sustainable you stick with the structure um, we kind of know that that's the case but is it really a lot of the times these decisions are taken without any proper uh, analysis so we took as i said sustainability attacking from the three directions uh, which is environmental social and economic so my part actually was to do an lca on the building and the building uh, design variations that we have proposed uh kin a colleague of mine was doing a life cycle cost analysis and then alina was doing a social lca which is a rather interesting field of, of, of uh, sustainability right now. Um, I would say somewhat still subjective, but there are efforts to, to make it uh, quantified. And then doing a little craning system out of all of that to say, okay, this is more sustainable than the other version. This is more sustainable to do nothing version where you just do business as usual as it is right now. And then the fourth scenario that we are considering is a uh, Dan uh, Denmark from the January next year, they're introducing a CO2 cap for the new construction above a thousand square meters, I think. And they all have to respect it. It's not crazily high looking at the research and, uh, and the studies being done right now, majority of the new constructions satisfy that cap, which is 12 kilograms per CO, uh, 12 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per square meter per year. Uh, but yeah, we, we have also found out some interesting stuff uh, that it's making the, the results of the analysis go down a bit. They are justified to some extent, but they have to be agreed upon on a, on a, on a higher level, I would say. Uh, I'm primarily talking about different projections about the energy mixes. In the end, it all comes uh, to the energy to heat that's being spent for producing the materials, uh, heating the building, running it. 
And Denmark is one of the world leaders, I would say, regarding renewables. So their predicted energy profile looks a lot better than it is in the majority of the Europe. So we managed to get with the transformation scenarios below that limit, a lot below that limit, but we are using a bit more conservative uh, energy impact profile that it's not looking into projected impacts from, from increased uh, ratio of, of renewables. It's really interesting. It's, it's as I said, broad, mm -hmm. but I like it. I like it a lot and I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to push into that direction once, once I uh, be, be, try to, to, to search for a job. Uh, Hannah, you, you, you um, were wanting to ask something. Uh, yes, uh, so thank you, Tomislav. You have presented us with the differences of writing a thesis uh, in Croatia and in Denmark. Uh, one of the questions we intended to ask is how would you compare the education in Croatia and in Denmark in general? What are some differences, some similarities? And also, uh, do you feel like the education in Croatia has prepared you well for this continuation of your education? Uh, I would say, so first of all, different aspects of education as always. Uh, I would say one of the most important ones is uh, relationship between uh, educators, which are professors, teaching assistants and students. Um, Croatia ranks, at least in my opinion, and what I've experienced at, at uh, University of Osijek and, and Faculty of Civil Engineering and Architecture in Osijek, uh, we, we rank pretty high. Uh, in majority of the top level universities in Europe, you have a pretty strict, I mean, it's obvious I'm talking from, from experience that I've heard about, not, not the ones I've experienced uh, alone about the other universities, but in majority of them, I heard that uh, you have a pretty strict relationship towards the professor who is the head of the, the course. He gets into the classroom, does a lecture, goes out, and the majority of the stuff that you're doing, uh, learning, uh, and, and actually directly communicating to some educators, that's going to be to the teaching assistants, uh, professor's assist assistants, and so on. Uh, Croatia is not like that. I haven't had that experience in Croatia, neither in Denmark. So I would say we are pretty similar when it comes to that. Open doors policy, come whenever you want. Uh, I mean, professors here as well have an open doors schedules, but I'm still to experience someone telling me like, no, 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 you have to respect it. Usually if they don't have time, they just say, can you wait a few minutes, come in an hour or so, but it's, it's highly flexible, informal, and then... It's really nice. When it comes to actual teaching, so the plan, program, curriculum, and so on, uh, even though my study line is, is somewhat scientific, my, my, my uh, title when I graduate is gonna be Master of Sciences in Architectural Engineering. Uh, I would say we still deal a lot with the industry partners. Uh, so <laughs> when I was in Croatia, tests are, majority of the courses you're getting evaluated by doing tests. Uh, I had two tests here. All, all of the other courses were project courses. And even though you're, I would say, less taught about terminology, theoretical parts, I think that the actual learning is a lot, lot better, uh, better quality. Uh, you're, you get some responsibility. As I said, you get a lot of freedom, a lot of freedom, but you get a lot of responsibility. You're going to get some general guidance, but it's your own task to communicate that with an industry partner, uh, with your colleagues. Majority of the stuff, actually all of it, it's, it's, it's a project work, a teamwork. So, you have to coordinate a lot of stuff. Uh, my education, to the question, you, you also asked how my education in Croatia has contributed. A lot, I would say. Uh, especially because I studied my, my master, first master's degree is in construction technology and management. And dealing with matter that I'm dealing with here, I'm having a lot less trouble 
understanding it from the construction technology part of you. Um, some stuff that we are discussing, that I'm discussing with my colleagues that are straight out of bachelors or some of them who didn't have any field experience. Uh, I, sometimes I, I find myself stuck in those discussions, even though I know the outcome, but uh, I usually just respect their uh, process of learning as well, because they are they're in the master study for the first time. Some of the topics I've, I've, I've learned doesn't mean they did. And a lot of times I have to be honest, they, they have a lot of stuff to teach me. Uh, I, was, I was pretty surprised when I came here. I'm a student who went, and you as well, Hannah, we went from drawing with a pencil, technical pencil, doing the, yes. <laughs> the what's the, what's the English word for it? Uh, pen. Uh, yeah. The, the, oh my God. Shower pen. Is it a shower pen? A pedograph. Uh, yeah. It's the same. Yeah. All right. Even better. <laughs> I don't have to struggle about finding a word. <laughs> um, doing that kind of, of documenting our work uh to going to cad autocad primarily and now doing uh, bim revit archicad uh, bentley whatever you choose while here you have students who didn't even touch upon cad even mm -hmm. their sketching is highly abstract mm -hmm. uh which is more than enough to, to transfer the message but when you when you say to them like oh can we do it can we do this detail in, in cad they're like why, why, why would I? I can just scan the elements from, from uh, any other BIM software and just do additional line work that I have to do. And it's the same thing. And it was, it was really an eye, op an, an eye opener for me because seeing how much they rely on, uh, on, on, on software, which is, I would say, good in terms of modeling and stuff like that. Sometimes it goes to a bad side. Uh, if you're using some structural or simulation software, if you, if you if you use it as a black box, that's that's going to be dangerous. It's not a matter of will it be dangerous. It's just a matter of when it be dangerous. When it will be dangerous. So, so yeah, that's, you would that's, say that. So you would say that that the students in, in Denmark have a better uh, background knowledge on, on BIM and tools for BIM than in definitely, Croatia. Definitely by by a long range <laughs> yeah this is something that we discussed as you said uh, on the last podcast i said that we had uh, from my perspective and i think that i'm qualified to to, to judge uh, we have this outdated uh, curriculum on higher education and even on in in high schools as you said i have also finished this uh, technician for for civil engineering we called it back then um, I'm a bit older than you. When I when I started high school, there was no uh, architect, architectural directions for, for, for the civil engineering high school. So I finished as a technician for civil engineering back then. And I would say that I agree, but uh, the idea is that uh, the BIM and even CAD is a way of communication among stakeholders in, in construction projects. Uh, Sooner or later, they will have to express themselves uh, to less educated, I would say, uh, stakeholders on the construction side, uh, to let's say investor, to some other discipline of engineering, and you will have to use paper and the pen. And then it's really, really important to have this symmetrical information among among stakeholders. So I think that you you have this elite. Uh, in comparison to them, because you have this opportunity to use either a tool, such as any, any kind of tool that you, you said, from SketchUp to, to, to yeah. more sophisticated BIM tools, but uh, you can always take a pen and, and draw a detail on, on a piece of paper and make yourself uh, understandable in, in the situation. So, okay, uh, Thomas, I, I was meaning to ask you, uh, the topic you, you said, it's really precisely described, and, and, and I can see that you you are close to the end. <laughs> so, uh, but what was the the background for for, for the sustainability and uh, historical uh, architecture in, in Denmark? 
did you have some classes, uh, courses uh, on subjects that you are now, I would say, using a, as a, as a background knowledge to to, to finish your tasks? Uh, I would say when, when the talks in Croatia started about uh, green transition and they are still kind of starting to be up to pace, I would say, but when they started, when we were maybe maybe second year of bachelors, um, it, it straight away, t it took my focus and interests to that field. Um, I think it really is the future, not just because we want to make our planet greener, better, more, more livable, but the economic models, they're changing greatly. Uh, we can see what insecurity in terms of energy, in terms of uh, supply chains can do to us. And uh, it, it always was in the back of my mind that that's the way I want to go. Uh, even if I didn't go to, 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 Denmark, to Denmark, I think I would pursue a career into that direction. The, the background behind the decision to, to, to go for this kind of, uh, to go for this kind of thesis topic, as I introduced in the beginning, majority of the buildings that we are going to be using, it, they're already built. So even some researchers claim that, okay, some of the bigger city centers, they're experiencing uh, an increase in the new built uh, stock. But for the majority of the cities, you still have buildings that are built in 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, you have to improve on that. And the way I, I'm, I'm thinking, as I said, my, my background is a bit more technical than, than maybe in, in some other architecture practitioners. Um, if I, I never was able to get a piece of paper with a plot on it and say, okay, let's start from this. I find myself working a lot more creatively when I have constraints. And sustainability is a big constraint. But then again, once you manage to find a way of making constraint, constraints work in your favor, it's, it's, it's beautiful. That's what I consider personally architecture. And I would strongly oppose, as you already did, <laughs> to a claim that architecture is strictly art. Uh, if you give a canvas to an artist, nobody's forcing him to paint just with blue color, just using these lines, just, just doing this, just doing that. When you're doing architecture, that's about it. You have this plot. You have, you have these, these, uh, these measures you, you need to follow, the, the regulations to start with, gravity. <laughs> I wrote this, this little chapter in my thesis, like I found a paper where a group of architects try to quantify the limitations of modular building, saying that if you have five different shapes of rectangles uh, and, and, and volumetric boxes, so to say, you have a limited number of combinations, which is uh, factorial five. Uh, you don't have it if you have a freedom to do whatever you want. But my big question is like, why aren't you treat treating the other constraints in the same fashion? <laughs> Gravity is a constraint and a lot of them struggle with that. They, they make this fancy concept. They really look nice. I'm, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the ways architects can visualize stuff. But then they go into a more serious design development. They figure out that they cannot build what they wanted. And then they st take steps back. Uh, the approach that my study line is proposing is try to incorporate those aspects in earlier design phases so you don't have to do it afterwards. And yeah, I, I, I wandered off a bit from the topic you, you asked, but no, I think no. I, I gave you the answer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you provided an interesting answer, I would say. But, but what you said, I, I was coping with that uh, on my PhD studies in Zagreb. Uh, it's called constructability that you are saying about yeah, modular yeah. architecture. And so, and the first, I would say, plot against constructability is 
exactly what you said. Where is our architecture freedom to, to design? And I would say that uh, let's leave the investor to decide <laughs> because we are here all for the investor. This is something that was brought up on the, on the last podcast. And I, I will bring it, I think, <laughs> so many times on our, our discussions with our guests because uh, we tend to, to, to forget that the investor is the main stakeholder in our construction projects. Regardless, is uh, one person, is society, or, or yep. so on. The thing is, so, uh, uh, to continue yeah. on the topic, if I may, yeah, yeah. Uh, sustainability has three approaches, three aspects, not approaches. And if you're going to look just at one of them, you're not, never going to make it work. If you want to popularize sustainability, uh, you need to make viable business models for people who are already doing the stuff you want to reinvent, so to say. Uh, a lot of developers here have a problem of saying, okay, for example, with our thesis topic, it's it, it was reuse of the existing materials on the building site. So a big question is you have a facade cladding, so to say, and it's on the building for 50 years. In that 50 years, it's really rarely that someone comes and says, okay, let's check up on those facade panels. Are they up to their performance requirements? But if you want to dismantle them, inspect and reuse, then they search for guarantees. So doing it at this point of time will create additional costs. Nobody, almost nobody, I think, would have any financial benefits of it. And the investor who is putting the money in it will say, what kind of benefits do I have out of all of this? Other than putting it in the newspaper, oh, we reuse the facade cladding. And if we don't think about the business models around the sustainability, it's it's a it's a it's a story gone. It's it's not going to happen. Yeah, but but it's always a matter of preference, I would say. Uh, if you put it as a decision without any further elaboration regarding the sustainability that you're talking about. Uh, the benefits for, for, for the investor have to be either for, from the main two criteria: duration of, of the construction, not just for the construction, for, for the building in its lifetime. And the second one is the cost, of course. That's it. Nobody wants from engineers to, to build uh, short-time buildings with, with uh, high costs. During, their, uh, during the building's life cycle. We want efficient, sustainable constructions, and, and that's it. And so for that part, investors all, all wish the same. So I think that sustainability only needs, as you said earlier, which is also quite interesting, uh, uh, quantitative merits, and that's it. You have this quanti quantitatively, uh, scale scale sustainability then you you can decide from the scenarios yeah i think on the, on the think other hand the context of of um, of a way businesses work in croatia and denmark are pretty important uh when when we talk about the ways investors look at uh at buildings in croatia majority of the time you have a company that needs to move let's say an office company um they need to move into new offices. They invest money in building a new building. And they consider that building being their home for the next, as you said, as long as possible. That's what makes it sustainable. Uh, businesses in Denmark work in a bit different way. They rent the places. And there's this phenomenon that construction industry is becoming sort of like a textile industry. You wear a shirt for a year, you throw it away. And... Uh, in some of the papers, the, the longevity of the buildings, at least the, the let's say, economic longevity, uh, the, the, the political or business longevity of the, of the spaces is as low as 20 years. So offices are used for 20 years by uh, uh, occupant. They move out. And if the office is not up to latest standards, the building is more or less gone. The, the yeah. investor, the owner, is up to a decision, renovate it or tear it down and make a new one. And 
yeah you, you can yeah, see yeah, what's yeah. happening the majority yeah, of the yeah you're absolutely right it's very hard to 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 understand this if you're thinking to us back in, in southern and eastern europe even in central i would say uh, although i have to say uh, i experienced some similar approach in germany regarding the this office uh, buildings and even the the idea of of uh, that rental is much cheaper i would say than than buying a house let's let's just go back to to your topic i have i said two questions and i only ask you one the second one what tools do you use i assume that you are making a and the beam models also i i'm curious to know what tools yeah. do you use uh for the beam ordering it's it's revit uh hana might be introduced to my preference towards archicad we were really <laughs> of course <laughs> like i i'm using archicad from high school that's when i first discovered i would say 3d modeling with with information attached to it to say to say that way, I, I had no idea about BIM and what it actually means, but I was using it to quickly create drawings <laughs> and all the other people were doing it in CAD. But I, I'm, I was strongly attached to ArchiCAD, uh, but the, the, the benefits of Revit are just overwhelming when it comes to plugins. And I would say BIM was, in our case and in general, looking at the research papers that we uh, explored at the... Uh, at uh, literature overviews and so on and so on, BIM is is a must. It's 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 if if it's not a main topic of the article paper, they mention it a couple of times at least, and yeah. uh, yes. that's that's that, that was the main framework uh, in Revit. And then, for example, for the LCA lifecycle analysis, we were using user based uh, tool called uh, one click lca mm -hmm. then for life cycle cost uh, analysis we were using a danish made program called aca lc uh, lcc bug bug means building so lcc building and that's about it some smaller or larger programs for um, structural i did a brief structural analysis uh, of the building uh, kin did a daylight analysis daylight factor that was done in a pretty awesome workflow where you have a dynamo and grasshopper scripts and, and uh, it's working with with revit it it's starting to go into programming sphere which i don't like but maybe just because i don't know how to program that's a thing to learn and i would have some, something to say about dynamo and parametrical <laughs> programming <laughs> and yes. the, but I, I was meaning that that it was the Revit an option or requirement for your topic? And I, I was meaning to ask you, uh, did you use any other tool during your studies in Denmark? Uh, the Revit, n nobody forces you to use anything. It's just- um, only, only the license, do you? Yeah, yeah. The, the, I mean, licenses are widely available, I would say for students at least in a trials that are manageable but for for us for, for our time uh, time scale of the thesis but as i said the the main decision factor was the the amount of plugins for uh for revit uh, mainly one click lca for example which basically you need to transfer all the amounts and materials to a different program and doing that through Excel, exporting from uh, Archicad to Excel, from Excel to one click, and then mapping all the all the materials, adds a lot more work than just mapping it straight in Revit through a plugin, and you have a done inventory in in, in one click LCA. But looking at it right now, when you start using a software, you need a lot of time to to get yourself introduced to some of the features of the software. Uh, none of us were we knew how to work in Revit, but it was by no means above intermediate level. Of and, course. Yeah, and and when we started to dig into some of the stuff we needed to do, we kind of realized that maybe because me and Alina knew how to work in Archicad to a greater extent, I would say from before, maybe it was quicker 
to do it in ArchiCAD just because we knew where st where, where where tools are. Um, yeah, but if I if I was if we did not choose Revit in this case, I don't know when will I re learn learn Revit. I was postponing it for a long <laughs> time. So you always have some pros and cons. Um, sorry, I'm I'm always like going off of the topic. Other tools you mentioned. No, 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 you're, you're, no, it's in the you're close to the topic. The, uh, <laughs> I I ask you uh, regarding the tools because I have this this opinion that Tecla structures is is a standard in the north. Denmark, it's Finnish, and so, so I would say Revit. Uh, These guys Revit. love Revit. Revit. <laughs> students, <laughs> students, students, some of them don't even know how to work in AutoCAD. All of them know how to work in Revit, and, and Revit, yeah. a lot of them use Grasshopper. It's wonderful when when you see what are they doing, and and uh, I have to learn it. That's my only conclusion every time I talk about it. <laughs> it's just uh, I need a bit of uh, a month free. To, to learn at least basics, so I can at least play the, with with the scripts that are already there. I don't I don't have to know how to make my own scripts just to play with the ones I have. Yeah, Hannah, but, yeah. Uh, you were. Wanted yeah, to ask Tomislav, that. I wanted to ask you since uh, you and the other students are actively using BIM, obviously, uh, and the whole faculty. And since BIM is one of the Construction 4.0 drivers, have you also mentioned the term of Construction 4.0 to your education? Or is that perhaps something that you can discover throughout your own research, your own uh, surfing on the net, reading articles? Uh, I have to be honest, their BIM education starts at bachelor's level. And it's not BIM education in terms of learning how to use Revit. Mm -hmm. One of some of the courses touch up on that, but BIM is a lot more than Revit or ArchiCAD or Tecla or whatever. Uh, BIM is, I would say, I don't know, a way of work. If if you have, I think it was in one of the. Oh my God, what was his name? Um, Professor Mario actually mentioned him in the last podcast. Um, Chuck Eastman. One? Yes. Yes. Uh, in one of his books, uh, he mentions that uh, BIM is like, if, if you have just one person in the whole stakeholder structure that's not working in a way of BIM, it's, it's almost useless. It requires a lot of efforts from all of the stakeholders and they learn that stuff pretty early. So they're yep. aware that that it's not just a program so the way i came about construction industry 4.0 and so on is exactly as you said from my own brief research i have to say if, if you ask me to define construction 4.0 i would not be able to but reading some informal articles on on, on, on some uh, web websites and so on i haven't looked into it from a scientific point of view yeah and when you put that in a context that Chuck Eastman defined BIM in 1980s. Yeah, crazy. And now it's 2022, and we still, I would say that I'm dealing with BIM perhaps maybe 10 years continuously. And still, uh, when I ask something, some, I would say, some colleague to define what is actually BIM, and I get different answers with the similar backgrounds of, of my colleagues. So when you call, of course, when you talk with, with uh, the practitioners, they would say it's 3D modeling and so on. But when you talk with architects, when you talk with uh, electrical engineers, when you talk with uh, structural engineers, then you will get uh, quite different uh, feedback and opinions regarding BIM, what BIM stands for. But this is, I would say this is a deep water. So I will leave it for that. Uh, I, I agree with you. It's a way of thinking, but I would primarily say it's a way of doing business in, in construction projects. Yeah. And just leave, leave it to that. But what Hannah asked, uh, this is something that, that of course, the, the terminology is not so, so important. What is more important to drivers, have you used any of the other drivers than BIM? Let's say digital twins or, or 
blockchain exactly. have you ever mentioned it in your studies in I, was, I was a part of a pretty interesting project when i came to denmark here solar decathlon uh and because of the highly uh, highly unstable travel conditions uh the project that we were aiming to build was in china and the question started being asked was are we going to be able to build it are we going to go there what's going to happen and in the end it's right now it's getting built in china i think in one of the cities in china uh and the plan is to have a digital twin in denmark because we still have so to say um rights to to, to the building and and, and uh, we designed it in in a majority of the of it was designed by DTU students, uh, supervised by DTU. It's, it, it started from DTU. Uh, so the digital twin is aimed to be in Denmark through different mechanisms. I also, I don't want to talk too greatly and detailed about it because I'm, I'm not, I'm out of the project for the last year. So I don't know that much, but that, that was one of the drivers for us to, to go with digital twins and, and, uh, and I think it's it makes a lot of sense in in our context, but it makes a lot of sense in in uh, in normal life, usual life context, such as like just monitoring the performance of the buildings and so on. Uh, blockchain, I haven't looked into it. I I'm still struggling to grasp the concept of block, blockchain out of cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's better to be honest. I I, I read about it. But my understanding of it is is far from being able to talk about it to a greater detail. And uh, going the path that I took, I, I, I don't find it necessary for me to know at this point. It would be interesting and exciting to, to explore it uh, in the future, of course, it, as any other as any other new technology. Yeah, uh, I think that blockchain we will have to all. It will not be an optional. We will have to deal with it. We'll see. A lot of people put their words into like, okay, this is going to be the main thing. This is going to solve. <laughs> yes. And then yeah. It blew out and, and uh, we'll see what happens. It's a really interesting period we live in, definitely. And yeah, it's, it's, I always, I always joke about this. When I came to Denmark and, and DTU specifically, the whole narrative is green transition. We're trying to cut our impacts. We're trying to make things sustainable. There are rather complex problems. Looking at it from strictly one perspective is not going to solve the problem. You have to be as holistic as you can. And I always joke, like, whenever I go see some new construction, I just start coughing from the carbon emitted. But it's not just carbon. It's a, it's a huge, complex system. And it's it's going to be interesting to see how is the future going to look like. I'm I'm really glad I'm living in this part of uh, I wouldn't say history, but part of time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is quite interesting coming from from a student. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tudor, uh, your question would fit. The first one would really fit the, this this topic that we're addressing now. Don't, yeah. don't you think that? Yeah, exactly. So thank you, Tomislav, for your very interesting inputs. Um, I The first question that I, I have for you um, is related to BIM, because uh, I think it's clear that the construction industry uh, will need to speed up the process of digitalization. And uh, we can all agree that BIM will be the game changer for, for the field of architecture and, engine and construction. Whether we are talking about the data generated or the whole project life cycle. So in this regard, I wanted to ask you, considering your, of course, your multicultural educational background and your experience acquired in uh, Croatia and, and Denmark, uh, what would be, in your opinion, the main challenge uh, regarding BIM awareness raising among junior professionals at this point? Whether we are talking about financial costs um, or the fact that there are too many solutions on software solutions on the market, and uh, companies or young uh, professionals do not know from which of them to choose, or maybe 
there, the BIM uh, concept, as you said, as, as a whole idea uh, is improper, introduced maybe in, in university programs. Huh. I would say the, the, the choice of program in most cases is it's not by, done by, by young engineers, it's done by their employers, uh, be it good or bad. That's, that's up to someone else to decide. Uh, what's going to be a driver? I did a little article with uh, one of my thesis mentors from OSIEC. We were researching uh, the implementation of BIM in Croatia and comparing it to some other countries such as Nordic countries, uh, we, we noticed two approaches, uh, bottom up and top down. Uh, top down would be Northern Europe. So basically government saying, all right, from this year or next year, you're using BIM because you have a lot of money in those projects. Uh, it's, 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 there's a great public interest in the project and so on. And then bottom up is what Croatia presents, <laughs> I would say, almost to the bone. You have pockets of BIM users across Croatia that are forming up into, I mean, as I said, pockets. So you have a friend, you know, they're working in their company with, with a certain BIM, BIM workflow. They're structural engineers, you, you are architects. Uh, let's make it work. Same with the MAP companies, consultants and so on. Uh, then when they, when they gather up, they form something such as uh, BIM Croatia. I think that's the name of the website uh, and, and such similar associations. And then they push the initiative towards the upper levels to a government and so on. Um, some would say that's not a good approach because if you s force people to do something by making it a law, or a regulation or a part of building regulations, um, it's going to be done badly. So they're not going to implement it to its fullest potential. Uh, I don't know what to think about it because if you see Croatia, for example, it's, it's crazy slow. The main drivers, I honestly, I don't know who they are. I would say the interest of the young students and, and enthusiasts in the industry. But then again, when you look at Denmark, Finland, Norway, Germany, France, UK as well, they're one of the first ones, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they have it on a, on a really high level. It, it came up to a point where even, even small residential, small scale uh, companies, designers are utilizing BIM and Revit uh, just because they, 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 they consider it stupid going step back, doing it in CAD. So it's it, to answer the question, it's going to be a lot of different things. It's, it's going to be students who are pushing their employers saying that it's bottom line, stupid to work in CAD doing all the, I mean, especially construction management, you have almost ever changing situation on the, on the construction site and you're doing it all over again after every single day. It's uh, at this point of time, almost forgetting about those more more conservative workflows, uh, I I don't see any logic in it. But then again, going the extreme way and saying that you have to do it, it's just going to make people do it bad. So it's a mess. Trust me. I, we we had a course where where we tried to dig through databases, get gathered from some early early BIM models. It really is a mess. <laughs> so. Different IFC properties, uh, property sets. Uh, we were digging through some uh, actual codes uh, in the XML format. It's it's uh, for me who doesn't know my my programming knowledge goes as far as if functions. Uh, I don't know what else. Uh, so it's it's not very deep, but we we managed our way. But it, it's highly complicated, and but maybe that's just a part of the story that has to happen. You have to force them to use it just because otherwise they might not even go that way. I, I don't want to be one-sided and say like, this is the answer, but just looking at, at the success that, that the other states had with, with the top-down approach, maybe that's the way to go, but maybe, maybe it could be too late for us. Maybe we have to embrace the bottom-up approach and, and try to come up with, with concrete guidance from 
practitioners in Croatia that are already doing it in Croatian context. And I, I would guess it's it's somewhat similar to, to, to some other Southern European countries such as such as uh, Serbia, uh, Montenegro, I don't know, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, and so on. So yeah, no universal answer, but it's gonna be complicated. I don't even doubt. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, as as you said, uh, making making BIM mandatory uh, probably in the long term uh, would be the um, let's see the best way of of making companies to to uh, transform their their way of thinking and making this transition from from CAD to BIM because otherwise. Uh, one of the main problems we have identified in our international working group that we have for Central and Southeastern Europe is that companies are uh, reluctant to use BIM uh, for the simple reason that BIM is not mandatory into their countries. And as a result, um, going to uh, making this step to, to BIM would imply for them to have additional costs, it would imply to buy a specific software, then it would imply to hire someone with uh, the necessary expertise to use these uh, BIM solutions. And in the end, if, if it's not uh, something that comes from, from the top to the bottom, uh, practitioners might be uh, stuck into this um, 2D um, era to say so. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to go from this to my second question because uh, you mentioned also the, the, uh, a bottom, bottom top approach necessary. Um, and uh, if uh, over, uh, partially you've already answered uh, this question because I wanted to ask you if you have uh, any advice for these young students or practitioners that like to promote uh, or to discover all these new big technologies in Europe. And uh, I, I saw that you, you recommended that maybe creating some general guidelines, guidance and then forwarding them to the national level or maybe even to the European Commission with uh, maybe together with universities could uh, create a, a bigger impact maybe and, and push uh, these national authorities and also the European Commission to uh, in turn prepare a set of general guidelines that could be applicable to um, to the European countries, maybe. Yeah, I would say educate yourself about BIM in general. Don't, don't be focused on workflows in BIM authoring tools. Uh, mm -hmm. No one, no one's making a promise that Revit is going to be relevant in 10 years. Neither Archicad, neither Alplan, neither Tecla, nothing. Uh, as, as, as Professor Mario already said, it's it's a way of thinking. And there are materials available. Uh, we mentioned Chuck Eastman, uh, a huge amount of them as well. Different ones, uh, standards. There are standards on BIM from ISO. Uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's a non-regulated field. You just have to educate yourself. And then choose your way, be it Revit. I mean, Software is a big part of it, but it's 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 far off being just software. So educate yourselves in that field in order to understand all the benefits, because the aim of BIM is to be relevant throughout the whole life cycle of the building. Uh, BIM is not done when you give the, the 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 building to an investor. There's plenty of opportunities to use BIM in. Uh, asset management right now uh, back again to the thesis that I'm writing um, there's a huge amount of efforts to make material passports basically databases that are connected be to a BIM model be to a BIM model or, or an external database or, or some third parties that might again create business models out of it and once you're done with 50 years of use of the building, you have a huge amount of precast elements, concrete precast elements. If you have BIM, which was model was updated, maintained through the uh, use phase of the building, you have the history of that 
or of those elements, uh, you can use them again. Now we're talking about circularity and back back to like BIM being a huge deal in the whole story. So knowing Revit to a expert level, it's not going to make you be introduced to those benefits. It's going to help you, but the same can be done. I mean, you can get LinkedIn daily almost, uh, open access browser-based BIM model, uh, BIM authoring tools. Uh, it's it's a great length we, we, we got to. We just have to utilize it. And the switch is going to have to happen fast, I think, because we, we are talking about bottom-up approach from Nordic countries in the terms of like grasshopper scripting, uh, people doing custom plugins, in-house solutions, while back home, we still struggle to make them use it on a basic level to be able to extract amounts, track the progress on the construction site and have basic means of attaching information in the asset management use phase of the building. Um, it, yeah, it's educate yourself in the basic principles, explore that, be, be, be curious and the rest is going to come. I, I, I'm still not in the practitioner's field of view. I still haven't started working, but I think that's a huge deal when you start implementing those basic principles into workflows that are you using, seeing some pros and cons and building upon it. And then you're going to be a part of a bigger community that could influence the governmental bodies, as you said, even as far as European Commission. I think actually... My first uh, master's thesis was about BIM. And if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> it was not a long time ago, but I might have forgotten, forgotten it. The whole start about BIM was to make construction projects more sustainable, uh, more transparent in terms, of, uh, in terms of managing money, financial aspects, and so on. That's why Europe started forcing a, this better new approach and then and, and being able to track the money flow throughout the whole life cycle of the buildings. So we are talking about sustainability and so on, but that's where it started. So also investors have to be a lot more educated. I have to be honest. A lot of them don't see benefits where there are benefits and being stuck in a really outdated mindset. Let's, let's call it like that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, uh, I think that what most practitioners and strategy makers seem to miss at this moment is that BIM should not only be uh, about 3D data, no. but also, also about ensuring that uh, every organization has uh, quick access to, to the information needed to, uh, to drive uh, effective cooperation, uh, and collaboration at every stage of the design, build, or operate life cycle. And yeah, I think that's that's the most important thing. And uh, one of the main conclusions to say so uh, for uh, in terms of BIM uh, nowadays. I would agree, definitely. Yeah. Okay, just just to make this record straight. Uh, it started in, in 1998, I think, uh, when Sir John Egan uh, published his report for the UK government. And he listed for the UK's most difficulties that they have in the construction industry. Uh, and then the rest of the Europe saw that and said, OK, we have the same problems as, as Egan's report. Does. And then we started to, to think what, what can be done. And then, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, constructability or buildability arose. And we said, okay, we could manage this, but how? And the answer is BIM. Yeah. And now I think that we are in the position of making BIM uh, solve those issues because now I, I can still, most of the, the issues that uh, Egan's report highlighted, we have, we still struggle with them. They are not resolved. Neither in, in UK, neither in USA, China, Croatia, Romania, regardless, we are still struggling with the same problems that you can said. But uh, the message you, you, you provided for the students, I will pretend to be a student now, not, yeah. but not as student as you were 
or you still are. I will ask you, I will, I will pretend to be a student from the majority of students. I will say, why should I? Why should I educate myself? <laughs> In my own spare time, finding the, the, the tutorials on, on web, uh, finding my, uh, as you said, there are numerous of uh, platforms that provide uh, webinars for using Beam and let's say firstly about beam and then how to how to use utilize uh, beam in, in construction i would say practice and this is the same question that if you would like to ask as i said in the previous podcast if you ask someone from the construction phase stakeholders they would say why should i <laughs> so the students and the practitioners would say would would ask the same question why should i use beam and as I said, I am really, I started with BIM much earlier than, than I started working here. So only these 10 years continuously, I'm working as a scientist on, on BIM. I'm, I'm trying to answer this question. And each time that I th think to myself that perhaps th this is it, this is, this is the main answer that I would provide either for students or for the practitioners, uh, I stand corrected then very shortly. Then some, some new issue of BIM uh, appears. Is it the interruptibility? Is it uh, who knows what we are dealing now uh, with BIM? So uh, the main idea, I would say that for the students now, they have to work on themselves beside the university and curriculums. And with this is... Should definitely that's the case. Yeah, they have to, they because have to we through. have guidelines. I have to correct you. We have guidelines also creations for BIM. I know. I, know. Uh, I will tell you also when I assembly uh, a chair or, or uh, a closet or anything, I do not read the guidelines. <laughs> I, I try to do it by myself, and then I afterwards I uh, when I if I I'm mistaken with something or I have a question, then I look to the guidelines. So. Uh, but this this aspect of curiosity to, uh, for for, the, for certain certain trends in construction during the, the studies this is that we lack I would say yeah. on higher education this is a critique to to students but to 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 professors among uh, I'm also to be criticized for that yeah but this is it this this is something that I, I faced even in Germany. I spent some time in Weimar and <laughs> students are students, people are people. This is the main idea. So, but I agree the most, as you said, it will have to be mandatory. I think in Denmark, 2015 was the year when uh, for the public procurement projects, you have to apply BIM for projects, I think, uh, uh, greater than 5 million euros. Probably could. I don't if know. I don't know which country exactly, but as early as 2010, some of them said, okay, you have to use it. Or was it just a decision and then it was implemented later? later? I don't know, but it was a lot earlier than we did. I mean, we still don't have it. It's No, no, no. I, I think in Denmark, it was 2015, if I'm mistaken. In 2014, we have this uh, mild uh, suggestion from the European Commission. Yeah. And nothing from 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 that. But it's and true. We have to be we have to be really precise. It will not. It cannot come from the European Commission. Such such a decision It has to be on the national uh, national I level. I think I read somewhere that like uh, projects funded by uh, EU, they have to be done in BIM. Am I, am I right? Still not. Still not. Yeah. Still I mean, not. it's not mandatory. <laughs> there's any opportunity to do so that's where they should act in in my own opinion yeah yeah it, it's not easy to answer this question that we, we came up yeah. to, to discuss now because uh, even though we have similar regulation and legislation in construction industry uh, among EU, eu members there are still so many differences that it would it would influence the market of on the national level if you would say it has to be done in beam in such such way and 
I think that that most of EU members are still not ready to to, to, to yeah. submit any any kind of solution that that would be relevant to the market. If it would be a, a, as a oblig obligatory to, on the EU level, but on the national levels, yeah, I think that we will have to cope because. Uh, we started this podcast with, with uh, the premise of construction for all. <laughs> we, are, we, we are mostly stuck in industrial revolution third, yeah. part three. And still, we are still coping with, with, with the issues back in the three. And we are not ready for the entire, uh, I would say, scope of, uh, of, of novelty that construction for all brings. And BIM is just one, one of the one of the spicy in the, in the scope. I so I, uh, I, I was meaning to ask you one more question that I think that students would like to hear. What is the difference between living as a student in Croatia and in Denmark? Ooh. Huge difference. Uh, huge I would difference. Say huge difference. Financial freedom is, is a lot higher in Denmark. Uh, meaning what? Meaning, meaning I'm, I'm mostly, not mostly, I would say 99%. I needed some additional funds from my parents to move here. But majority of, of my expenses and everything, I earn a bit of money on the side and I get a scholarship from the Danish government. And that's, that's I would say, more than enough to, to live here more than comfortably. Uh, the career support, for example... I think all of the universities here have a career center, which is connecting you with uh, with opportunities while you're studying and after you're done. Uh, the alumni commun communities are a lot, lot stronger. Uh, it's, I think it all comes together with just trying to connect the universities and faculties in, 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 in contexts more relevant for Croatia. Uh, with industry partners. Through this, Denmark is pushing above its weight when it comes to big companies that are international for the size of the country Denmark is. Croatia is by no means on that level, but I think companies and universities as well should be a lot more interested in doing business together. Uh, in only one of the courses in Croatia, we had an opportunity to cooperate with uh, City of Osijek on doing some feasibility studies on uh, relevant proje projects at that time uh, in, in Osijek. All of the other stuff that we were doing was project, uh, project semester projects were mostly done on a basis of preset form. You just get a variation of it. You do it. You you. It may it makes us really good in in recognizing patterns. So you get a problem. You search for a pattern in your little toolbox that you used before, and then you want to implement it. And then if you get stuck, you're stuck. So again, the and also there's a common. I would say statement from, from the empl employers in Croatia that students coming from university don't know nothing. You have to spend an additional year to learn them, your way of business. And that, that comes partly from them not knowing what students do simply because they don't do work before they hire them together. But the other part of it is that students to some extent are a bit uh, like that. So they have a, pattern toolbox, use that pattern on designing a concrete beam, leading a construction site and so on. If you don't fit into those uh, fit into those limits that you get introduced to, you, you're a bit confused. So that's that's uh, that's what I would say is the, is the biggest difference. So it's I think it's not a big step to do. It's not too hard to do, but it's going to bring a lot of benefits to, to the student life and to the education quality in, in Croatia. Yeah, uh, this is the first answer that you you brought uh, as an uh, architect. <laughs> because I, I, I have to correct you. Uh, yeah. Engineering, civil engineering is patterned. You have to know that. 
the problems are, are repetitive and, and only the solutions are, are slightly different, but the approach, we are strict in, in, those, in those patterns. You have Euro codes, you have a way of, uh, of traditional way of business and then it's not easy to, to make uh, uh, on the, on the, for the students, to uh, let's say, project-based problem that uh, would provide students to think out of the box in civil engineering. It's very hard because we, 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 are, we are based on the mathematics, on, on, on statics, on dynamics, on, on optimization methods, on uh, scheduling methods. Then it's very hard to leave it on the students to, to come up with a, with a different kind of uh, way of business that would provide equally qualitative, uh, quality of, of solutions. So this is this is something that I would say I would I see that in in perhaps a slightly different kind of uh, engineering discipline such as architect architecture. So, but I, but you you missed the point. My question was, how do you feel as a student there? Are you comfortable in Denmark? I I think that I, I can say that this is relaxed podcast uh, on Friday. Yeah. Was it hard to be a Croat in Copenhagen? <laughs> <laughs> just, just to make this as a timestamp uh, on Friday, Croatia in the middle of Copenhagen won one, no, one zero to, to, to yeah. Denmark. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> close to 40,000 people in, in Pagen Stadium. And then yeah. I would say close to 20,000 people in front of the stadium. Yeah. It was crazy. And... Uh, <laughs> I was I was there with a friend from Montenegro and uh -huh. we were cheering for Croatia, but like when we scored, it was in yourself, like, yeah. I would say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Imagine sure. was like Danes were celebrating the offside. Imagine if they really <laughs> scored a goal. That would be a huge celebration. Yeah. yeah. But I'm just joking. I, in general. I, I was meaning to ask you. Uh, because uh, I remember myself as a student. Yeah. Uh, I was always worried, worried about the tasks, about the exams, about deadlines, about, uh, I, I don't know, cooperation with my teammates, my colleagues, and so on. And uh, I, if I would have to summarize my, my master thesis, I would say, studies, I would describe myself as worried guy. Uh, yeah. When I came to, to Germany, <laughs> I was really surprised how students can be relaxed and open-minded. So I was thinking to, uh, to ask you, is this the case also in, in, in Denmark? Yeah, definitely the case. Uh, we, have, we have five bars across the, the campus. People are almost daily there and um, as I said, you get you get a bit more freedom, which comes with a bit more responsibilities when it comes to the tasks. But it, it, it also has, when you're working in a team and for almost all of the project courses you are, um, the, the mindset of the students that you said you recognized in Croatia is kind of filtered out because it's not gonna be the teacher who's gonna say, the professor who's gonna say like, all right, guys, you're not doing your job. You're going to get a bad grade. It's going to be your student colleagues <laughs> that are going to say if you don't show up on two out of three meetings. All right, my friend, uh, it's all right. You have your own struggles beside this, but just be sure to come after this because it's five of us, four of us doing this, not minus one. And if you want to participate, it's, it's not even that uh, rare to have uh, an agreement so at the start of every project report, you at, or at the end in the appendices, you would have a uh, agreement saying we all agree to work to the same extent, uh, contribute to the yeah. It's really common, and in that way you 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 feel what everybody is expecting from the project, and you can plan according to that. Um, I'm I was not that much on the like having fun side. I did all of that in Osijek. I was on bachelor's. Uh, studies in Osijek, uh, quite a lot of going out uh, during the masters as well. I came here really honestly to, to learn as much as I can. 
so I was, I'm, I'm worried still, as I said, right now, I'm worried that we did a lot of stuff, but we might not be as successful at communicating that stuff. Uh, but always when I look back to that worrying, in most of the cases, it was useless. What was useful is you actually doing stuff and planning your time. So as you, a lot of times said during the lectures, even not planning anything is planning, uh, to fail. So, <laughs> uh, so it's, it's Anna, a... would you like to ask uh, Thomas something before, because we are close to the end of, of our second podcast? Of course. Um, of course. Maybe to finish up with the discussion, what are your future plans right now after this education? Uh, we have heard that you would uh, like to definitely work um, on something related to your thesis. So are you perhaps considering uh, even another European country or not even Europe? I would, I haven't been planning to going out of Europe, to be honest. It's, uh, as creations, we are <laughs> from bureaucracy. So getting a visa, moving to anywhere, <laughs> of Europe, yeah, I'm not ready for that, but Europe is up, up for grabs. I would say, uh, I, I, I have to be honest, uh, as I think you would feel the same as, and, 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 um, uh, and and uh, I don't know how to phrase it, to be honest. Uh, culture is a big part of our lives as Croatians and, and uh, Southern Europeans, Eastern Europeans in general. I would be the happiest if I could contribute to the industry, to the to the to, to my colleagues and to to, to the, how stuff is done in, in Croatia, in, in Slavonia, to be particular. Uh, and but not by any means uh there's also quite a lot of different life aspects that i need to take care of but we'll see what happens as i said i'm open to, to europe in general uh it, it, it's really really easy to, to to go to any other european country right now with open borders and so on but I know there are companies in Croatia that are looking at stuff and, and how, how things are done a bit differently and, and more in line with what we were talking today. Uh, one of my like conditions that I'm not going to go against is like, no way I'm going back to 2D. Uh, <laughs> no, no way, no way. That's, that's I don't think if, if, if back to the economics of the implement implementation of BIM, if your business model and success of it is going to be dependent on you implementing BIM, you, your company is doing something else wrong. It's not AutoCAD BIM or, or any other workflow. You, you have to rethink the whole uh, structure. Um, and then we'll take it from there. I, I just saw recently, uh, I think it was Green Building Council Croatia. They, they actually, I was talking about it with you, Hannah, uh, the, database yes, the other day are uh, using bim workflows in their uh, in their daily businesses and that's going to be a starting point for me when it comes to croatia and then filtering it to, <laughs> to our region we'll see what happens uh, i would like to work with with renovations i i feel like that's where i thrive the most i feel like that's challenging to me at this point of time i think i can learn a lot lot more while doing that, and it's going to be more and more relevant as we as we uh, go towards the future. Um, yeah, that that would be somewhat short answer to your question. I wanted to ask you another thing. We were mentioning Grasshopper. Have you tried doing any work in it, or how did it go? No, no, not yet. But yeah. now, now perhaps I would. <laughs> it's it's a big piece of cake, but. Yeah, <laughs> then then we would have to continue the discussion after we know what we do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. In that uh, direction. Uh, were you thinking to ask Thomas for anything or to add to the discussion? No, I'm just happy that uh, Tomislav mentioned about uh, 
GBC Croatia because they are actually one of our, let's say, close partners in, uh, uh, let's say, raising awareness on BIM, but also on uh, energy efficiency in buildings and CO2 reduction in the construction industry. And such, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that he, he mentioned them. And I, we are really... I'm not sure if they're the ones who, who posted the database, but nevertheless, they do amazing work. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. They, they were all, uh, actually, they were, uh, they were keynotes in one of our previous uh, conferences we had. I think it was in uh, last, last spring. Uh, but yes, I, I do not have any, any further questions. Uh, Mario, if you have anything to add, Yes, yes, I have one thing that uh, I left intentionally for the end. During my career here at the University of Osik, I had uh, uh, on five occasions, uh, near to the end of, of students' master's uh, degree studies, I, I suggested to five of, of the best students that I, I felt comfortable to, to suggest such, such a thing. I suggested uh, five of them to, to most definitely to, to PhD studies. Four of them are now, one is in Slovenia doing his PhD study, Hana is the second one, one is in Rijeka, one student is uh, on his first year of uh, PhD studies here in Osijek, and the only one who hasn't <laughs> gone that way is Tomislav. <laughs> Should I consider uh, 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 <laughs> this is my question this, uh, on the beginning I said to my great surprise you went to, to, to study architecture which is great uh, you mentioned the, the motivation and so on but uh, just to connect the, the, the thought that I, that I presented here not, not the thought it's more than a fact uh, engineering is the patterned work. We do we solve problems by using a methodology that we are certain of, and uh, the the output is solution or solutions. And when I started work working as an engineer before I came here, after perhaps two years, I said, "Okay, I, I got it. I know." Now I, I, I can e extrapolate my, my, my uh, life, I would say, my career uh, till the end. Solving problems using or creating, but on a small scale level, uh, uh, solutions that can only serve to me and to solve certain kind of problems. And then I, I was sure that uh, I can, <laughs> I'm not up to that. Uh, uh, the science is something that, that is great, I would say. Let's put it more in, in a more simple way. If you're a grown child, then science is, is for you. It will fulfill your, your I would say, curiosity. Curiosity, yeah. <laughs> uh, it will, it is like a playground for, for grown ups, I would say. So I would really like you to just think one, once more regarding the PhD studies, not because of you're the only one who hasn't gone that way. <laughs> and, but I, I'm sure even uh, today, I'm even more sure when I hear, hear what, you, what you are doing now in, in Denmark, in, in different kind of uh, environment than, than we have here in Osijek. I'm 100% I'm sure that you could go and be really successful in, on, on PhD level and in science. What a nice words. Uh, to be honest, I, I, I'm not going to say I've never thought about it. I remember still the talk that I had with you when I came for, uh, I wanted to have a recommendation letter for you from you for, for the Denmark studies. And that's when we had yeah, a talk. I remember. I remember you said to me like, why? Why do you want to go <laughs> yeah, study? Yeah. Yes. Hoping you're gonna stay for the PhD. <laughs> I, will, I have to be honest now. I'll say if you're going for RCH, I will not give you this this letter of recommendation. <laughs> but I was joking, of course. I'm gonna to try to be a link between uh, engineers and architects. That's that's 
I've never considered it being in conflict in the first place, but it, it, I, I guess it's happening in the industry. But back to the PhD, I, I, I'm not going to say I've never considered it, but uh, I definitely want to, I have a feeling that I have knowledge that I want to implement now and learn from the practice. And I'm not disregarding it by any means sometimes in the future. I would, if I find a field that it's, that it's worth of, of, of time, because PhD is a huge thing. I think you, 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 you're up for a like, couple of years long uh, journey and five, yeah. So dedicating yourself to something just because doing it, it's, it's not a right uh, reason. If I find something that, that is interesting enough to me that I want to dedicate five years of work to, I'm definitely up to it. I'm a, a lot of, a lot of professors, uh, including you, if I can remember correctly, asked me like, you had five years of studying, you still want to do two, like majority of your colleagues are going to work. They want to earn money. I'm like, at that point of time, right now I'm, I'm kind of, I wouldn't say getting sick of it, but I really enjoy learning. I really enjoy the pr process of listening to someone, transferring their knowledge to you and just trying to be curious in that process. And that's, that's the best way to learn. Of course, at the end of the day, you're going to be studying by, you're going to be learning by heart some stuff that you need to pass on the exam or something. But the stuff that's happening beside that, I think that, that has a lot greater value. And I, I really enjoy it. And I can say I'm really happy with what I got in Denmark and in Croatia. And PhD is not not disregarded by all means. It's just I I, I don't think I would be making a a properly argumented argumented decision at this point of time in my life. I, I'm flattered by by your nice words and uh, and uh, I, I'm still considering it a compliment. Just so you know that I'm the only one who did. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, I, I said it as a, as a scientist, as a fact. Okay. <laughs> so if it's a compliment, then it's a, it's a <laughs> it's subjective. I'm gonna, it's a I'm gonna compliment. That's the argument. Additional value, additional <laughs> value to the fact. Then. Okay, Tomislav, thank you, thank you for your interesting uh, point of views and and your experience that you wanted to share with us and our, our let's say, mostly students that we will. Have a look at this podcast. That this is something that I would like to to be a fact. The students will will be attracted to your uh, guessing at this podcast. So thank you. This is it. This is our second podcast. Uh, stay well. Stay safe. And see you in Osijek when you come back. I would really like to have a coffee with you. Yeah, I agree. I'm I'm gonna get back to you too, so we can drink a coffee or something in the in the course yeah see you okay. on yeah thank, thank you. you thank you mario Anna, tomislav it was a really great session uh, i'm grateful that we managed to have this open discussion and uh, just wanted to add that uh, the podcast will be added in short time on our platform and also it will be and on linkedin so that anyone who might be interested can access it and share it with their network so thank you guys Great. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.